morning, everyone. I am Leandra Letterman. I'm the William W. Oliver Chair Emerita in Tax Law at Indiana University Maurer School of Law. And welcome to the Tax Policy Colloquium. I'm really happy to have here today Young Ran Christine Kim, who is a professor of law at Cardozo Law School. And she was previously an associate professor of law at the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law, where she taught federal income tax, taxation of business entities, and an international tax seminar. Her research centers on international tax, business tax, and taxation in the digital economy. She received an LLB summa cum laude from Seoul National University in Seoul, South Korea. She is a JSD in tax law from NYU School of Law and an LLM from Harvard Law School, where she was awarded the Landon H. Gammon Fellowship for Academic Excellence. Professor Kim is a member of the Korean Bar and the New York State Bar and has worked at Yulchan, Captain Drysdale, and Sullivan and Cromwell. And today she's presenting her very interesting paper, Taxing the Metaverse, which is forthcoming in the Georgetown Law Journal. So with that, Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leandra. Uh, thank you, everyone, for inviting me to uh, the Tax Policy Colloquium at Indiana University Morrow School, School of Law. Uh, today, I am going to talk about my project on the metaverse taxation. And personally, I'm very honored to present this paper at this colloquium because uh, my project uh, is uh, inspired by two important papers. Uh, and the first one is Professor Liederman's uh, seminal paper, uh, Stranger Than Fiction. And the second paper is Professor Gamage's paper on the ultra proposal. So without those two papers, I couldn't conceptualize uh, this paper's theoretical framework as well as the implementation strategy as well. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to start my presentation and launch my slides. All right, so people's first response to this paper, Texting the Metaverse, is that the paper has such a fascinating title, and I agree. <laughs> and this is uh, a generally accepted definition of the metaverse, and let's read together. Uh, the metaverse is an expensive network of um, digital spaces, including immersive 3D experiences in augmented virtual and mixed reality that are interconnected and interoperable so you can easily move between them and in which you can create and explore with other people who aren't in the same physical space as you. And... Um, uh, the metaverse relies heavily on blockchain assets like crypto and non-fungible tokens or NFTs, then you may start to be skeptical about this topic. Uh, we observed the FTX fallout in November 2022, and two famous Stanford law professors are also involved, and one of them is a tax professor, unfortunately. Also, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't want to talk about the metaverse anymore. And um, do you see the date of this art news article? It's it's written on February 11th, 2023. And uh, I submitted this article on February 12th or 13th, I remember. And you can imagine how devastated I was when I submitted this paper. Uh, but fortunately, this paper found a good home. So that's good for me. But still, you uh, want to ask why I am doing this project. Uh, first, it is an important topic for the law, technology, and business field. There is a reason that Facebook has rebranded as Meta and Microsoft has acquired Activision. Also, the metaverse has important implications in tax and public finance, and uh, it may have broader implication to you even if you are not a tax expert. Okay, so let's uh, understand the metaverse first. The metaverse evolved from online video games. And so that's the left side of the slide. At that time, the business model and economics focused only on user consumption. That is, the players did not involve any economic activities there, but rather they enjoy playing the game. And from a tax policy perspective, it was considered as the realm of consumption of your after-tax income. Uh, of course, sometimes users obtain income in the online video games, like loot drops, and that's income, and uh, that is subject to taxation. 
And an ad hoc income taxation, like, you know, taxing loot drops from time to time for those rewards wasn't up back then. On the other hand, now uh, we have metaverse on the, on the right side. The metaverse now allows users to produce income and accumulate wealth entirely within the metaverse. Uh, so don't get me wrong, uh, the Super Mario used to be online video games in the past, but now it should be considered as a part of the metaverse because uh, there is no like hard lines between online video games or the metaverse. It's just a differentiation in the era. And now even the Super Mario game allows other activities like, you know, producing income or accumulate wealth in the uh, in the virtual world, and that's generally understood as the metaverse. So why the metaverse feature that allows users to produce income and, and accumulate wealth is important. That's because our tax system chose income taxation as the primary tax system. Now, various economic activities in the metaverse satisfy the comprehensive definition of income under the Hague-Simons definition, Section 61 of the Internal Revenue Co Code, Glancial Glass, and so on. So um, th that means an ad hoc income taxation in the past is no longer enough. We need to discuss whether such income and wealth in the metaverse should be subject to systematic income taxation and how. Uh, but the traditional tax rules uh, still focus on the consumption aspect of the virtual economy. And I believe such an approach is outdated and we cannot and should not apply the current role as is. Uh, I also challenge the traditional norm of realization in tax law and modernize the policy debate concerning emerging technology like the metaverse. And I'll show how metaverse can be a laboratory for experimenting cutting edge policy as well. Okay, so now let's dive into the metaverse and see what economic activities are going on there. Uh, of course, you can still have fun, which is similar to what you used to enjoy in the online video game. In Second Life, you can buy a house or go to a party event with your friends. Here, the party is not offered by the platform company. It is now uh, offered by another user. And such user charges a small fee to you in virtual currency like Linden's. So for you enjoying the party, it is still a realm of consumption. But for the party host, it is a business activity in the real world. And the host is now earning income within the metaverse. What about rewards like loot drops? There was a discussion whether loot drops should be taxed as income, and if so, how? But as I said, it was all ad hoc basis and the rules are pretty laxed. But now we see many people pursuing virtual rewards as a full-time job, and many of them earn more than six digit income per year. And they also trade virtual items within the metaverse, which is also evading income tax base under current law. What about workers receiving salary? Can they ignore the metaverse taxation because they work in the real world? Uh, well, there is a recent article by the New Yorker magazine saying that uh, why your boss wants you in the metaverse. Well, actually, more than a handful of consulting and professional services firms open their virtual offices in the metaverse. And those firms use virtual reality to transform the way they engage employees, interact with customers, or create products and services in the metaverse. And for that purpose, employees need, need to be in the metaverse too. And the employees receive virtual assets as compensation for their service in the metaverse that also relates to the metaverse taxation. And the reason why the employers like professional firms offer their services in the metaverse is that uh, there are many business opportunities there already. Uh, for example, the Sandbox is devel developing a metaverse city in Dubai called Dubaiverse. And another important economic activity is self-created assets like NFTs. In the real world, self-created goods or services are sometimes considered imputed income uh, and avoid or defer taxation until they are sold. But theoretically, they are also income at the moment they are created or produced. 
but we give up taxing self-created assets or imputed income for various practical reasons and mostly for administer administrative reasons. And we will have the same problem in the metaverse. And there's even bigger problem in the metaverse because at least in the real world, the sale of the self-created property or the resulting capital gains is subject to tax. But in the metaverse, it may not be subject to tax as long as the sale occurs within the metaverse. So, so far I showed various economic activities generating income and wealth in the metaverse. And the categories are like earnings and profits, self-created assets, rewards, gains derived from dealings and virtual assets. But the current law seems to defer taxation of such until a realization event or a cash out event. And this paper challenges this approach. The ideal method of income taxation is, uh, I believe, mark to market taxation or immediate taxation of your income and increase in wealth annually. But we choose to adopt the realization requirement mainly for administrative reasons. And in more difficult cases, like catching a record breaking baseball or a deep sea fish, we even retreat from the realization requirement and defer taxation until a subsequent sale. Uh, in other words, the law asks to apply the treasure trove regulations, uh, which consider the finding activity or like you know, finding the treasure trove as a realization event. But in practice, the IRS waits until you sell the baseball or fish. And I like to call it the cash method. And again, current law seems to defer taxation of the metaverse income until a realization event or in more difficult cases, cash out events. So let me present this three paradigm cases. Case one is income generated within a single metaverse. And case two is income generated from an activity across metaverses. And case three is cashing out the income and wealth in the metaverse and exiting into the real world. If these cases happen in the real world, not in the metaverse, then case one is subject to tax, of course, not to mention cases two and three. Uh, of course, there are certain exceptions due to the realization requirement, but those are the rules in the real world. But when it comes to the metaverse, we only pursue case three for a taxing event, which is a cashing out to real world. I believe that's outdated and uh, the, the law should be updated. Uh, and uh, as a solution, as a proposal, I'd like to push the boundary to uh, at least case two and in a more aggressive and, and ideal proposal, I'd like to move the boundary to, to case one as well. And furthermore, I'd like to overcome the realization requirement in case one as well in the metaverse. Okay, so um, the assets or wealth in the metaverse should be taxed immediately upon receipt uh, in general. And I believe that the digital nature of the metaverse allows tax administrations to move away from the realization requirement and its resulting inefficiencies, inequalities, and administrative burdens. And for such immediate taxation, I support a mark-to-market method known as the ultra system to overcome the intrinsic valuation and liquidity challenges of the metaverse taxation. So let me explain my proposal with greater detail. Uh, first, I'd like to explain the ultra proposal first. Ultra means unliquidated tax reserve accounts, and it is proposed by professors Brian Galley, David Gamage, and Darian Shansky for California Wealth Tax Reform proposal. And uh, there is a discussion of whether uh, a mark-to-market taxation is mathematically and economically equivalent to a wealth taxation to circumvent the constitutional challenge of the United States. But uh, I just used the proposal, the ultra proposal, as a mark-to-market income tax proposal. Uh, and the ultra system uh, can give the government a notional percentage stake in a taxed asset upon receipt, but it is very smart because it defers actual collection of tax until uh, the sale of the asset. And uh, the upside of this ultra proposal, as any mark-to-market tax proposal would be, is it can remove the incentives for tax deferral. 
by removing the realization requirement. If an asset goes up in value, the tax on that asset goes up by a proportional amount, uh, essentially charging the taxpayer an interest rate equivalent to their internal rate of return. But uh, in another mark-to-market proposal, uh, it has like any inherent challenges like valuation and liquidity problem. But the ultra pro proposal uh, slightly, you know, sm smartly overcome these challenges by deferring the collection of tax until the subsequent sale. Uh, and that's why I like the ultra proposal and try to uh, extend it to the metaverse. Uh, that's because uh, one of the downside of the mark to market proposal is because it requires tracking changes in net wealth and value in unliquidated assets. But I I believe that the digital world records all digital activities. So taxing the metaverse can afford this new methods of monitoring and tracking individual wealth. So let me explain how this can be done. So this is an uh, in-game market for uh, a digital item. Uh, so if you want to craft a potion, in the metaverse, you need to pick flowers or you can go to a shop and buy flowers as well. And this flower is uh, priced in in-game cash like gold, silver, bronze. And you can, you know, you can go to uh, a yard and pick flowers or you can go to a shop to purchase uh, flowers uh, in an in-game market. But you can also go to a third party market uh, for the same item. And as you can see, the value of such item is closely tracked in a real-time basis. And the, uh, of course, in a third-party market, the value is denominated in a dollar amount. Uh, this is another third-party market. And for the in-game market, the price is nominated in uh, in-game uh, in cash instead of a dollar amount, but such in-game cash is also ha has also exchange rates in real time in US dollars, euros, uh, Korean won, uh, Chinese yen, and so on. So uh, that's why I, I think that the digital world records all digital activities and applying ultra to metaverse is uh, is viable option. And uh, this deviates the ultra proposal a little bit, but for practical reasons, I'd like to limit my tax proposal to virtual assets with real economic value, uh, meaning that it can be converted or at least valued in a taxable currency like crypto or the US dollar. Because, you know, if we expand this proposal to a closed loop currency without uh, any actual economic value uh, convertible to crypto or US dollar, then um, I actually can't see how to apply it in the real world. So, uh, eventually, I'd like to overcome that limitation, the narrow definition of my proposal. But uh, for you know, as of now, I'd like to limit my proposal to uh, on digital uh, items with real economic value. Okay, so that's how I want to expand the ultra proposal to the metaverse. And as I explained, ultra proposal is kind of a cutting edge policy, tax policy uh, in a modern uh, public finance. So this is how the metaverse can be used as a laboratory for experimenting such cutting edge policy in a controlled environment before we actually apply this proposal to the real world. And even if the ultra system is rejected, I still urge policymakers to push for immediate taxation of uh, exchanges between metaverses, which means paradigm case two. So uh, ideally, it would be awesome to push the boundary to case one and overcome the realization requirement by adopting the ultra proposal in the metaverse. But, you know, more realistically, if that's not going to happen, then I think uh, push the boundary to at least case two is the proposal that we should pursue. Okay. Uh, so when I present this paper to non-tax audience, uh, general audience, 
uh, this theoretical framework of, you know, why we have to think about texting the metaverse income is the most interesting to many audience. And if when I present this paper to regulatory scholars like FinReg or antitrust scholars, then uh, they are fascinated by the idea of using the metaverse as a laboratory for experimenting cutting edge policy. Uh, but when I present this paper in front of tax audience, this compliance part is the most fascinating for them. Uh, and you know, personally, it's also the reason why I started this project. Uh, I, I do a lot of tax and technology scholarship, but my route is international and business taxation. And this compliance is really related to many advanced topics of international tax. So uh, this is my personal dear and uh, near and dear topic. Uh, and we need to identify the proper tax jurisdiction for compliance first. And there are two possible tax jurisdictions. The first one is the residence of the taxpayer. And the second is the source of income. And for the residents of the taxpayer, the tax authority will likely rely on the user's IP address for residence taxation. But we all know already that it'll be challenging to find the correct address because individuals can easily disguise their IP addresses. And the second uh, tax jurisdiction is source of income. But in some ways, the metaverse is everywhere and nowhere all at once. Then what tax jurisdiction is the source? The first candidate is the, tech, is the metaverse's server location. And I believe the server location is a highly plausible tax nexus, but it is still only a proxy for the metaverse, which has no physical location. And we saw in the past that companies manipulate server locations, like moving servers to a low tax jurisdiction. Uh, so it could, it, you know, the server location is highly plausible tax nexus, but it still has problem. But interestingly, my uh, students actually uh, gave me an interesting idea that Maybe in the metaverse era, this server manipulation issue may not be a, may not be serious because uh, data takes time to travel, uh, because the current technology is limited by the law of physics, which is the speed of light, and light travels around Earth seven point five times per second, and data needs to do a round trip, right? And the volume of data transfer in the metaverse is immense. So if I put a server on the opposite side of the Earth. It would take about 0.2 seconds for me to ping the server and for data to travel back to me. And uh, the metaverse users are tech savvy and sensitive to slow page loading time. You know, the potential manipulation of server location may not be serious compared to the past. But, well, I think, you know, that's actually a funny thing to talk about this metaverse issue. Uh, and, you know, people might still consider the server location as an improper nexus for sourcing income. And if that's the case, then the location of the metaverse platform companies might be a good and practical option. Then uh, we might have to think about the platform's compliance duty as well. Uh, because these these platform companies create and run the new virtual world. So their roles in tax compliance and administration may have to be strengthened. So uh, it is worth considering introducing a withholding tax system for metaverse income. Okay, so um, I'd like to stop here and I'd like to elaborate further issues in compliance during the Q&A. And um, thanks for your attention to my presentation. I'd like to, uh, I look forward to your comments and questions. Mm -hmm.